More on Facebook a bit later, but for now, let's get to our big interview of the day. Wilfred Frost is in San Diego. He is sitting down exclusively with J.P. Morgan's chairman and CEO, <clears throat> Jamie Dimon. Wilf, take it away. Hey, David. Hey, Sarah. Good afternoon to you both. Thank you very much. As you said, I'm here uh, with the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan, Jamie Dimon. Jamie, thank you for having us again. Well, happy to be here, Sarah. David, how are you both? Um, let's kick off with why we are specifically in San Diego. You're right. just kicking off your annual bus tour. You go yeah. and visit uh, uh, branches and, and meet lots of your employees. Yeah. What's the biggest thing you've learned yeah. from that process over the years? Yeah. So we do a bus trip. There's like a lot of trips. You meet people, clients, customers, employees, call centers. This one we do by bus, kind of off the beaten path. You know, not San Francisco and L.A., but Malibu, uh, San Diego, et cetera. And, uh, you know, because these are both clients and employees. We do a town hall later. We learn a tremendous amount, what we can do better as a company, you know, what folks would like to hear from us more about. And so, uh, and we have a lot of fun. We get to know the management teams better. On the bus in between, we take, you know, between some of these branches and stuff, we take tellers and branch managers and ask them, we give them beer and immunity and say, tell us what, tell us what we need to know so we can run a better company for our clients. And, and you've got a very warm welcome here, uh, which uh, I'm not sure how many chairmen uh, so far up the chain would get. Is that something that, that warms you? That, that you take a lot of uh, positivity from? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I love our people, and you know, this is our 10th. This is the 10th anniversary of Wamba, which is why we're doing this particular yeah. state, and then we're heading up to Seattle. And uh, yeah, you look, you know, basically a company is its people. You, they deliver to your employees. They want to do a good job. They want happy customers. And we talk about client obsession. We mean it, but that has to start with me too. I have to talk to the clients. I have to have them, my lunches and dinners and town halls, and, and we have to listen to our people, because our people are the ones dealing with the customers every day. You mentioned the WAMU acquisition. Ten years since that, you wouldn't have the footprint you have here in California uh, if not for it. But you've also been a bit critical of some of those acquisitions you did yeah. during the crisis. Ten years ago, if you had the time again, would you do this acquisition again? Absolutely. You know, WAMU put us into California, where we really weren't. Florida, we had a very small presence. Washington State. Uh, and we've gone from like 1,400 brands to 1,800. We've gone from, they didn't have small business lending here at all, or very small. We now have $7 billion loans up from something less than a billion. So it's, it's just a great, it's been a great thing for those states. In every community that where you know, WAMU was, we now have commercial banking, investment banking, private banking, uh, corporate social responsibility and philanthropy. So it's been great. The, the, the negative I always talked about was you know, we were punished a little bit after the fact by the government on some of the bad things that WAMU did. But you know what? That's in the past. But we're moving forward. You're one of the few big banks still actually expanding your branch footprint. And that's more in new geographies than just arbitrarily having more branches. What's allowing you to do that? Is it the regulatory environment that it now allows you to push into that? Or is it because you see weakness in some of your rivals in, in those geographies? It's the regulatory environment. They had made it clear they didn't want us to expand. I don't know why. I mean, I think it's a wonderful thing to do. So we're opening. We've announced 400 branches uh, pretty much between Washington, Philly, Boston, a few others. And we go to those towns. We do small business lending, LMI lending, lower middle income housing lending. We do, uh, you know, we do a lot of corporate responsibility. So it's really good for the towns. I remember we already do business in a lot of those towns in credit card, private banking, middle market, large corporate investment banks. It doesn't add any incremental risk at all for us to open branches. So we eventually want to you know, grow across the country and fill out some of the cities we're not in. Let's talk about the broader U.S. economy. We had a 4% uh, percent handle on the GDP print on, on Friday. Do you congratulate the, the president on that number? Was he right to take a sort of victory lap after it was announced? You know, presidents get a lot of credit, a lot of blame for things they didn't do. But the president has done things which accelerated growth. So competitive taxes, we needed competitive taxes. And the way the American public should think about it, for 20 years, we've been increasingly uncompetitive, driving capital and brains overseas. Regulatory reform, and I'm not talking about a big bank, I'm talking about small business. If you sat down and you do it one day with small businesses, they'll tell you about the crippling bureaucratic paperwork litigation that's, that we've had less small business formation in America than in any other recovery. So yeah, that, this has accelerated the growth. We had 20% over 10 years. It should have been 40. The reason it wasn't 40 was because a lot of things that we did hurt ourselves. So I'm hoping we continue to have policies that accelerate growth. And growth is good for all Americans, That's, which is why it's so important to have some kind of growth agenda. Is 4% sustainable? I think we could do a lot better than two. And I, I firmly believe that the, the reason it was two was not some natural reason. It was bad infrastructure, bad taxation, excess regulation. We don't graduate kids at inner city schools. 50% don't graduate. We don't give kids the skills they need. We don't let felons have jobs again. We have an opioid crisis. I, you know, like, take bureaucracy. It takes 12 years to get, to get permits to build a bridge that's already there and failing. And it took eight years to put a man on the moon. 
So the American public looks at this stuff and says, that's what's holding it back. It was us. So it certainly should be a hell of a lot better than 2%. And I don't know if the natural rate is 35 or 4 or 3 but it's not 2 Let's talk about the president's trade policies. Uh, we talk about the U.S. economy being strong, but China's GDP that just uh, came out was 6.7%. If that trade battle with China continues to escalate, who wins it ultimately? Who yeah, can so take right it? Right now, I'd put in the skirmish category, and you know, and we the, we the business community is pretty much represented to the president that we agree with a lot of the issues raised by China. The business community in general would have approached it differently, which is to get Canada, Mexico, Japan, and Europe to have a common front to present to China the way trade should be done. It needs to be fixed. We want it to be fixed. He's taking an approach which, you know, I'm a little worried could create these negative outcomes. We've told the president that. I'm hoping his methods work. If it becomes more in the skirmish, if you do $200 billion more and you do uh, the auto tariffs and stuff like that, yeah, I think it could offset, you know, some of the benefit we've had from the good things he's done. You said you told the president that you yes. disagree with his tactics. Yes. What was his response? He obviously does agree with us. And so, uh, no, but I would also Does tell the, I, I was also, I was also tell the president that his two of his advisors told him, and I'm not going to name them, but they told him there will be no retaliation. We said there absolutely will be, and they were wrong. He, they, several people said there would be no effect on consumer spending or inflation, and they're wrong. So the fact is, some of those things are wrong. I, I want him to do what he want, I want him to succeed at having better uh, trade. I think NAFTA should be done. I mean, they, they've been talking about this for a long time now. It should be done by now. Mexico is a wonderful neighbor of ours. And we should move on, do a deal, do a deal with Canada, and then you know focus on China. Now, uh, clearly, as you've already said, you disagree with his tactics. But if we consider uh, the news that came out of his meeting with uh, Jean-Claude Juncker last week, that there is progress between the U.S. and the EU, does that suggest that in the long term he may be proven right that this could all work out for the best? It, it, it may. I mean, I, I don't know any better than you. Uh, and be you criticize his advisors for giving him the wrong advice on tactics? Well, no, I think that they, I think there's been retaliation. And I think if we do it, there'll be another predictable round of retaliation. And there'll be a mounting uncertainty and a reducing investment. And, it'll, you know, it'll eventually slow down the GDP. And, of course, no one wants that. There are better, we think there are just better ways to do it. But obviously, we want him to finish a trade deal with China that deals with the important subjects. You know, reciprocal ownership, uh, how intellectual property gets handled non-tariff barriers and stuff like that. So those issues are all real. They need to be resolved. Uh, in terms of his team, uh, Jamie, were you ever offered a job in his team? And, and given that you, you question the advice he's getting, do, do you wish you'd taken it if you were offered it? I'm, I'm not going to talk about conversations. I'm, I'm very happy where I am. I love my company. I love my job. I know you do. Yeah. And uh, we will certainly be coming to that a bit more later. Just on the topic of the president uh, as well, very quickly, the president said in a press conference just now with the uh, Italian prime minister that it would be okay to have a government shutdown uh, that related to the, the fact that he wants to get funding for his, his border wall. What was your response to that? I, I think it's been tried before and it hasn't had good outcomes. And it hurts a lot of people who really have nothing to do with the process. So I think the political process should learn not to use those kind of things to get what they want. I understand the president's point, but, but this is, that is not a way to be productive and conducive to growth. Let's talk about the uh, Fed and, and interest rates, uh, Jamie, if we may. The president made clear in an interview with CNBC a couple of weeks ago that he preferred lower rates. Talking about the Fed's hikes, he said, quote, I'm not thrilled because we go up and every time you go up, they want to raise rates again. I'm not happy about it. But at the same time, I'm letting them do what they feel best. Did he go too far with that statement, commenting on Fed policy? Look, a Fed is given their mandate by Congress and that mandate is quite clear. You can argue whether it's the right mandate or not. I think the other thing that, that everyone should think in mind when they talk about interest rates is why are they going up? So if they're going up, and they're going up gently, if they're going up because the economy is strong, that net nets a very good thing. So it's very hard to look at interest rates and separate that as one factor and you know, say it doesn't relate to how the economy is doing. So I think as long as rates are going up and the economy is strong, we're going to be fine. When we look at the shape of the yield curve, a lot of people get concerned about the fact that it's flattening. Does that, to you, suggest that the Fed is going a little bit too fast, that they should take the foot off the hike uh, pace for now? No, I think it's, an, again, a very simplistic way to look at it. That's one factor. There are a lot of other factors involved. And while well, in history, that happened before, but we have growth. I personally think the 10-year bond is going to be going up, not down. But again, like I said, for good reasons, you know, a natural rate for the 10-year bond today with inflation at 2% would be 4%. And so, you know, we've had a suppression of rates for you know, the better part of a decade around the world. Those things are reversing, but so far to good effect, which is Global growth is going to be as strong as it's been in a long period of time, and America looks like it's accelerating. So as long as they're raising rates in that, that's fine. Um, when I think about your share price, Jamie, and for all of the big banks, it's been so 
tightly correlated with what the yield curve is doing. How do you think about that? Is that correlation overdone, uh, whether we get a slightly flat, a slightly steeper curve? Do you think people, the share price reaction to it is overdone? So we make a very clear disclosure. What do interest rates alone do to our P&L? Now, of course, that's not what the world is, right? Interest rates go up and down for a reason, but alone, rates going up, short rates going up helps our P&L, helps our profit line. So, but I think there's an overreaction to that. I think banks are all different. You know, we're going to do quite well as a bank regardless. We don't take bets in interest rates. But if you think that rates are going down, the tenure, because the economy is weakening, obviously that's going to affect all banks. Yeah. I just think that's not, that's not what's happening out there. Yeah. So. Um, in terms of uh, the equity market, uh, Jamie, the, the, there's been some big tech earnings misses in the last couple of weeks. Facebook uh, was the high profile one. The Nasdaq is down sharply again today. When you see uh, those earnings uh, numbers and you see the market reaction, does that to you suggest the equity market, perhaps particularly the tech sector, is a little bit overheated right now? Not really. I think some of those things are very company specific. And obviously, companies that have very high PEs, when, you know, they, when your forecast, the future changes a little bit, it's going to dramatically change the stock price. But if you look at stocks, if you think we might have a good economy for a couple of years and their earnings are going to grow 5 10 percent or more, even if PEs come down because rates are going up, that's, that's a very likely outcome. So I'm not saying it's going to happen. I look at the possibilities and probabilities, but it, the economy looks quite strong. Consumers in good shape. Their balance is in good shape. There are no potholes out there. Lending has been pristine. Capital expenditure is going up. More people are going back to work. Unemployment may hit a, a post-war low at one point this year. Those are all positives. And we don't have the leverage in the system we had in 07. You know, there's always going to be some kind of problem, but that, that is not the problem today. Um, Sarah and David, I'm just going to throw it back to you guys for one minute. Uh, it's very warm out here, and I just need to get myself a glass of water. Give me, uh, give me a minute if you just check in on the share price action. Uh, and we will be back uh, with the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan in just about uh, a minute's time. You got it, Well, Yeah, I noticed uh, Jamie uh, dabbing his uh, brow there. It does get hot under the lights. It's not I don't just know. San Diego as well. Welford had his shirt on button, though. He, he be did. Cool. He did, yeah. Um, J.P. Morgan shares for their part are up 0.63%. Interesting listening to, to Jamie Dimon uh, discuss, of course, you know, not necessarily saying we can get 4% GDP, but certainly believing we can do better than 2 A hell of a lot better, I think, was the quote. Because of what's happened, he said, post-crisis, post he said... He, Framed it as a self-inflicted limitation toward growth. The fact that it takes yes. so long to get anything done, the bureaucracy, the regulatory burden, and the fact that President Trump's policies are addressing that and a competitive tax system. He says that's why we should be doing a lot better, and, and we are, and, and that's a big debate. Talked how about a lack of uh, not any potholes out there. Of course, that does raise that question of actual potholes. Because infrastructure, which Mr. Diamond did mention, and perhaps Wolf will get to this, uh, has not been something on the agenda as yet, or certainly not something that has advanced a, a good deal in terms of the things that the Trump administration originally at least seemed to be focused on. Let's get back out to Wilford Frost in California with Jamie Diamond to continue the, the conversation. Wilford, take it away. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, Jamie, we're just talking there about the equity market and uh, whether things perhaps get overvalued. Do you think there is uh, a point at which we're getting closer, where we're due another significant pullback? We saw one in, in February, of course. You know, I don't predict the stock market, you know. I think you've got to look at the underlying stuff. So is there a chance the economy is strengthening and can go on for a couple of years? Absolutely. If that's true, then stock prices are justified. If you think we have a recession tomorrow, no, they're not justified, but I don't know. It looks to me like the recession has been pushed. There will be one. You know, someone has asked me at a town hall, you know, is there a recession? Well, of course. I just don't know if it's 2020, 2021, 2022, but it looks like it's not 2019. You know, so the economy seems to be strengthening. That's a good thing. Uh, recently, uh, we had uh, the CEO of bb and on, Kelly King, uh, to talk a little bit about the banking industry dynamics. And he said there that he is, now that regulation has been eased for banks under $250 billion in assets, that he is considering some consolidation uh, at some acquisitions. Do you welcome a little bit of consolidation amongst the smaller banks below you, or is it unfair that the regulation hasn't been eased for you as well? Yeah. No, for, I mean, we've always said that they should do what they did, which is deregulate de for the smaller banks, and they need to consolidate to compete. So I'm totally sympathetic with that, and we've never held that hostage to whether we think some of the rules on us are fair or unfair. You know, the regulators are looking at all the various rules. A thousand were put in place. People point out one. There are thousands, and they weren't necessarily coordinated, well thought through. They may have adverse consequences in the next downturn. They should look at it and recalibrate it. No one's asking for Dodd-Frank to be thrown out. And we are the, probably the biggest bank to small banks in the country. So we want them to do well. It isn't like 
it's not us versus them, and it never was. In terms of uh, potential acquisitions, uh, you were linked with maybe making a bid for Deutsche Bank, ruled that out. But is there a, a sort of rationale behind why one of the U.S. investment banks would look to buy some or part of Deutsche Bank, particularly its U.S. operation and investment bank? I, I can't answer that question. There, there will be, over the next 10 years, in my opinion, new competitors in, bank, in the investment banking world, including, by the way, from China. Some people may merge to get more kinds of scale. You know, I think in Europe they're going to have consolidations too, but before they have that, they actually need to change some of the regulations there around banks so they can have, you know, a pan-European insurance system, a pan-European regulatory system. But it, it makes a tremendous sense of logic that those take place over time, as they have in the past. But as you know, that merging investment banks is a very complicated business. Uh, so we talked about bank, we talked about tech. If we just go back to the broader economy very quickly, what is the single biggest risk to the economy? Is it politics or is it the Fed or It's, it's trade if the, if the skirmish becomes more of a war. Uh, it's, I would say the reversal of QE, and I don't want to scare the public, but we've never had QE. We've never had the reversal. Regulations are different. Monetary transmission is different. Governments have borrowed too much debt. And, uh, and people can panic when things change. So it, it's changing. We tell you it's changing. We know it's going to change. But when it happens, it might have a, some effects that people don't expect. And I think it is bad policies. You know, bad policies lead to bad outcomes. And I always hope that people do a better analysis. Like, what are we trying to accomplish? How are we going to get there? And let's make sure we understand the effect of these policies. The amount of unintended consequences from bad policy is staggering. And, you know, I, I, if I write a book, I might write about that one day. How we didn't think through some of these policies they put in place. Let's talk about uh, your healthcare initiative with uh, Berkshire Hathaway and Amazon. Uh, you bank a lot of healthcare companies yourself. W what has been their response to you for, for you kind of moving into their space, as it were? You know, some were unhappy because their stocks went down that day, which I think was a kind of an overreaction. We hired a great CEO. I explained to those, I spoke to many of them, by the way. I said, no, we already buy insurance for 400,000 people for JP Morgan, and I want to do a better job. And we're going to put more brain power and more capability to figure out how we can make you healthier and happier with better satisfaction. We're totally aligned with Jeff Bezos and Warren Buffett, Amazon and Berkshire. We think together, if we have the right people, a long-term view, we're not profit-seeking, that we can do what we're doing a lot better. We don't expect progress in immediate future, like a year or two. But if we come up with some great stuff, we're going to share with everybody. We're not there. And I'm, so I all told all these companies, help us do it. You know that some of these things need to be fixed. Don't act like we're the enemy. The enemy is that we're now spending 20%, almost 20% of our GDP on health care. You know, and, and, it's, and it's too much, and the outcomes aren't good. So we, we, you know, in America, we have some of the best and some of the worst. And so we've we got to just do a better job. Have you or do you expect that you might lose any clients because of this process? I don't expect so, but if that happens, so be it. Has it been a, a more tricky process than you expected? Is it perhaps less worthwhile, given the, the, no. the grief you've got? No, this is an absolute critical issue. And all of us have a very long-term view. And we've been through the amount of money spent on fraud, administration, end of life, the misuse of drugs, chronic care problems, wellness problems don't work. Like, obesity and smoking drive a tremendous amount of heart disease, cancer, depression, stroke, you know, uh, diabetes. And we've got to get at this as a nation. And we think together we might be able to make some progress. So we're going to, well, we all said we're going to give it our best shot. And we're going to be very patient. I remind people that Jeff Bezos, when he started Amazon, you know, he, I mean, he may have had visions about the everything store, but he started with books. And he spent 10 years getting books right. So we may spend a bunch of time getting one piece of it right before we, and he, testing various things to see what works. He, uh, he offered you a job, didn't he? Do you, he, do you he, wish you'd taken it? He didn't it? offer me the job, but he was looking for a president. And I flew to Amazon after I had left City. It was fired from City. And uh, we had a great lunch. We've been friends ever since. I had this vision. I'd never wear a suit again. I'd live in a houseboat like Tom Hanks. That movie, Sleep in Seattle, will come out. And, uh, <laughs> but it, it was just a bridge too far for me to move my whole family to Seattle at that age, at that time, to something I didn't fully understand as opposed to I've been in financial service my whole life. So. Well, your stock options at JP have been uh, profitable, but it would have been even more so at Amazon. But uh, anyway, you're not wearing a suit today, so hopefully it all comes together. I see, and you're wearing Chase Blue too, by the way. Well, so, this is so thank you. you know, I see a lot of your staff out here is wearing is, Chase uh, Blue. I hope if you're all from New York, you all have Chase accounts too. Is, uh, and if you ever have a problem with Chase, you can call me directly. This is uh, closing bell blue, but uh, anyway, <laughs> the, uh, just want to quickly ta talk about the uh, the Me Too movement. CBS uh, stock has been down sharply the last couple of days over allegations uh, against the chairman and CEO Leslie Moonves. So far, all of these stories that have come out have been focused in one industry, mainly in the media industry. Do you think 
there are some types of stories like that to come from Wall Street or not? Look, I, I think there's bad behavior everywhere, OK? And, and I think it's important that all companies try to root it out wherever it is. And they have the right listening post up to HR. And HR's got to listen. They can't just, like, act like the company's always right, legal. As I've asked a lot of our senior women, you know, as you know, half of my direct reports are women. I said, you all set the tone. Make sure we're doing it right. You know, but, of course, you worry in any big company when you come to any location that that branch manager over there, you know, is holding your job in the hands. You may, not, you may be afraid to use one of those hotlines. So we are always looking for ways to make sure that people here are trusted and respected and not mistreated. And, and we should all strive to do a better job. I want to ask a little bit about Lloyd Blankfein, if, if I may, Jim. Of course, the two of you, the only two remaining uh, CEOs of the big banks from pre-crisis times. Do you think Goldman Sachs would have survived the crisis if not for him? Oh, God, I don't know. You know, look, Lloyd is a, is a friend. I think he's a wonderful guy. He's a great leader. And he did a great job taking that company through a really difficult time. Um, you, you joked uh, in a comment to me before that you hope you see more of him going forward, just, just socially, or is there a job well, I, for him? I, Lloyd and I see each other socially and our spouses, and we have a great time together, so I'm sure he'll continue to do that. In, uh, in his statement uh, when he uh, announced his retirement, he, he said this uh, about the timing of his departure. When things are going badly, you can't leave. When things are going well, you don't want to leave. So if you're going to go out on your own steam, it's always going to be at a moment when you don't want to leave. By the way, that's why people sometimes stay too long. Jamie, do you have the energy to take JP Morgan through the next recession, or, or would you rather stand down at the yeah. top? I, to me, it's got another, I, mean, I agree with his statement mostly, but I love this company. I love what I do. When I don't have the energy, I should step down. I mean, I think if you are on the playing field, and you're the quarterback, you better put on the jersey and give it your all. The second you say, well, I want to take 10 minutes out or skip a game, it, you, you can be part of the team. You can't be the quarterback. You, know, you can't be on the field. So but I have the energy, and to me, it's not nothing to do with the recession. There will be the right time. It's up to the board. It's not up to me. Uh, and I think we have great success at the company. I mean, we have a, a, some outstanding uh, leadership here, and so uh, we're totally comfortable that there's plenty of succession when I'm hit by a bus or it takes place in five years or so. On, on that topic, uh, another comment from Lloyd in, in terms of staying down. He said, David is ripe and ready, and he's the right guy. Uh, is somebody below you ready today, if necessary? Yeah, I think there's several. Um, and the board, more importantly, the board thinks that. OK, fair enough. Have you got any advice for David Solomon as he takes over the, the reins at Goldman? I, I, I call David to wish him my best. I know him a little bit, and uh, I'm, I'm sure he'll do great. You know, these are big jobs. It takes a while to, yeah. to navigate all the different parts. And, and the other thing is, you know, when you come out of one part of the company, you really should make sure you focus a lot on the other part. You know, really walk in their shoes so you understand it deeply, and uh, I'm sure he'll do great. It, you know, Goldman is chock block with talent. Mm -hmm. It always has been. You may not know this. I worked at Goldman in the summer of 1981 which I think is the summer they bought Jay Aaron, which brought Lloyd Blankfein to them. Um, and uh, obviously on to City and, and uh, Bank One after that. You, Jamie, you, you love your country. Uh, you comment about it very often. And increasingly, you talk much more about politics than perhaps you, you did in the past. Has it crossed your mind to run in 2020? No. I mean, look, it, it, people mention it, and it crosses your mind. I don't think I'm a natural politician. I do think policy is so important. And I am a patriot. This country has the best hand ever dealt it's the, of any country ever today. It's the most prosperous economy the world's ever seen. You know, it should be growing fast. We should be helping far more Americans get jobs, felons back to work, wages going up. And I said, I made this long list of problems that we did to ourselves. And so, you know, that, so I do take it very seriously. And I think the business community has to get involved to do the work, to have proper policy, to create growth that's good for all Americans. It can't be parochial. You know, if businesses are coming in, the one thing they need to help them now, the American public aren't going to buy that. But, you know, like the BRT, which I'm the chairman of, we try to focus on, we have immigration policy, tax policy, trade policy, innovation policy, work skills, getting kids, whether it's high school, community college. When they leave, they have the skills that give them a job that's well-paying. And there are tons of them. And so I think if we fix these things, America will be far better off. Do you think there could be more business leaders that run? I mean, clearly, the president uh, was a business leader himself. Do you think Howard Schultz would be a good candidate? You know, look, I have to leave it to Howard. I think the world of Howard, you know, I think if you want to embark in a political career, it's a whole different thing than the CEO, and, and he's got to explore and figure out if it makes sense for him. But I think he's been an exceptional leader. I know you talk uh, a lot and care about the opinions of your family and your, your daughters uh, in particular. Do, have you talked to them about how much longer you want to be CEO for? Well, I, obviously, I talked to my wife about it. Hi, Judy. And uh, my daughters and... Uh, 
Yeah, look, I love what I do. So, you know, to me, I always worry about, which I've told them, it's like, if, if you said to me, do nothing, I'd be, like, lost. You know, I, I played stuff, I enjoy stuff, I do a lot of stuff, but I, I like what I do. It isn't like I, you know, uh, regret it every day I go to work. I mean, there are days I regret, and there are certain things I have to do I regret, but for the most part, I love what I do. Well, Jamie, uh, we thank you for, for your time today. I know you're very busy and uh, that you love what you do, so thank you for taking the time out thank you very much. Uh, to talk to us. And thank you for wearing your Closing Bell blue shirt thank as well. You. Perfect. <laughs> Jamie Diamond, the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan. Guys.